Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It's been a while since we had one of these virtual lunch and learns. I'm excited we're back. I hope you are too. If you are new here, my name is Raheem Thompson. I am the manager of public programs at the museum. I'm excited to bring this special program of music of remembrance here. Uh, we have a great cast of people here. We have a we have a special guest. It's going to be great. We will have time for Q&A at the end of the program. If you come in late, uh, still keep your questions at the end. Um, now we'd like to pass things off to Mena Miller, who is the artistic director and founder of Music of Remembrance. I hope you all enjoyed the program. And again, please keep your questions to the end. But if you have them, please drop them in the Q&A function. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Raheem, and thank you, the Illinois Holocaust Museum, for hosting this webinar. And I want to thank all of you in our audience for joining us. We really welcome you today. As Raheem said, it's been a long time since we've had a webinar uh, now that we are thankfully post pandemic. I'm Anna Miller, founder and artistic director of Music of Remembrance. And please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel composer Jake Heggie. Librettist Jean Shear, and author Howard Reich. Thank you so very much, Jake, Jean, and Howard, for joining us today. We are so appreciative. Would you please start by introducing yourselves to our audience? Jake? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jake Heggie. I'm a composer. I'm based in San Francisco. Uh, I primarily write opera and song, but uh, compose the gamut. And I've been working with a music of remembrance uh, since 2007. And we've done several pieces together. Um, all of them have been in partnership with Gene. And um, the one for next year will include Howard Reich. So we're, uh, we're really happy to be here with you today to talk about some of the pieces that will be upcoming with the uh, Chicago Opera Theater. Thank you, Jake. Hi, my name is uh, Jean Shear, and I'm libret a librettist. And uh, as Jake just intimated, uh, Jake and I have worked together for many years and uh, very uh, lucky to have worked with Music of Remembrance on a number of pieces and the one that's upcoming. Uh, my career is, uh, uh, about 99% of my career has been working as a, as a librettist um, with pieces around the country. And, uh, uh, but uh, coming back to uh, Music of Remembrance and this uh, beautiful organization has always been a a touchstone um, uh, for me and for Jake, and we feel very fortunate to work uh, with them, bring these pieces to life, and to have the chance to talk to you about these uh, upcoming pieces uh, today. Thank you, Jean. Howard? Hi, I'm Howard Reich. Um, I'm the son of two Holocaust survivors. I'm speaking here in Skokie, Illinois, at the Illinois Holocaust Museum, which is a key institution for, for remembering and for chronicling, for telling stories. Um, I was a music critic at the Chicago Tribune for over four decades, and I've written various books, and some of my stories have become books, some have become films, um, some become documentaries. None before has ever become an opera, and that's lucky for me, and we'll talk about that later. I get to collaborate with uh, Jake and Jean and watch them create a work of art, so I'm eager to get to talk to everyone today. Thank you so much. It is truly thrilling to have all of you with us. And as you know, we're joining from San Francisco, New York, and Chicago. So that's just, just great. The miracles of, of Zoom, uh, the, the blessings of the pandemic, there are very few, but this is definitely one. Um, music Remembrance might be new to some of you. So I'd like to take a moment to tell you a little bit about our work. I found in Music Remembrance 25 years ago, in response to a deep personal calling. In 1998, I was established as a university professor and a performing pianist. As um, a child of parents who were, had families that were totally annihilated in the Holocaust, I was hoping to make the next step in my career to be something where I could make music make a difference in the world. And I, I grew up with a visceral awareness of the power of memory and of the vastness of stories that needed to be told. And music remembrance was a way of pulling those strands together and of giving voice to those who had been silenced. But we've come a long way in a quarter of a century. We've continued to discover and share a priceless legacy of musicians who refuse to be silenced. 
And we've also shed light on the experience of a spectrum of those whose lives were touched by the Holocaust, not only Jews, but other religious groups, gay people, Roma, modernist artists and writers, political free thinkers. And we've not merely looked back at history, but we've confronted its meaning for today with our commissions of new works that address the challenges of religious intolerance, racism, xenophobia, the threats of nuclear war, the worldwide refugee crisis, and the plight of families separated by borders. The past meets present in stories of our time. Well, it's been a privilege of a lifetime to have commissioned and to premiere five works, five Holocaust-inspired works by composer Jake Heggie and librettist Jean Shear. Jake and Jean are among the most gifted and important creative teams in the opera world today. And I'd be saying this even if they weren't on this panel with us. It is true. <laughs> and as I said, it's been the privilege of a lifetime. And this May, in collaboration with Chicago Opera Theater, we are going to bring to the Chicago stage for the first time the original versions of two of these works, Another Sunrise and For a Look or a Touch. And today's webinar, we will preview these works and also tell you about the newest work in progress of Jake and Jean, a one-act opera that they have titled Before It All Goes Dark. And this is based on a remarkable true story with a direct Chicago connection that author Howard Reich discovered and reported in the Chicago Tribune. So we have a full program for you, and I hope you stay with us. We will start with Another Sunrise. Another Sunrise dates from 2012, and it is based on the incredible true story of Christina Zawolska and her day-to-day -day fight for survival. The woman we know today as Christina Zawolska had an amazing history. She was born Sonia Landau in 1914 to Jewish parents in Wacz, Poland. In 1942, she and her, and her mother daringly walked out of the Warsaw ghetto in broad daylight. She changed her name to Sofia Wisniewska and worked for the Polish resistance until she was arrested by the Gestapo the following year. Refusing to reveal names to the Nazis, she changed her own name to Krystyna Zawolska. Krystyna was sent to Auschwitz as a political prisoner, not as a Jew. As a prisoner with no experience as a writer, she wrote morale-boosting lyrics to popular songs and folk tunes of the day. Lyrics of protest and survival. And since it was terribly dangerous to write these words down, her lyrics spread by word of mouth from inmate to inmate in the camp. Christina could also not escape the constant fear of her Jewish identity being discovered. The fellow prisoner in a position of authority was moved by Christina's words and decided to save the camp poet. And she did that by giving her a position in a safer place, the effect in Kammer, the warehouse of personal effects. And there, Christina's job was to take inventory of the possessions of Jewish women and children who would soon be marched to the gas chambers. Christina heard the screams and cries. She saw the smoke and she smelled the stench of burning flesh. That was the horrible price she paid to survive. I'll let Jake tell us more about this work. Thank you, Minna. Um, the nature of memory, how we, how we deal with experiences like what Christina went through has always fascinated uh, me and Jean as creative writers. Um, what we choose to remember, what we choose to live with every day, how we incorporate it into our DNA. And um, of course, this is, this is true for people who have survived any kind of horrible life event, but in, imagine surviving something as cruel and horrible as the Holocaust and being told that you're heroic for being a survivor when most survivors don't feel like heroes, they were just surviving. And I think we really wanted to explore that, that part of Christina's journey. Um, it moved us very much. Jean found uh, a beautiful story to tell 
and a beautiful way uh, to tell it. I'll let him describe that. But it, uh, we are very interested by the idea that if you don't embrace the things that happen to you, that if you push them aside, are you doomed to be haunted by them forever? Um, and so on this dark night of the soul that Jean conceived as the journey for Christina, you know, she has to decide, is she going to tell her story? Is she gonna write a different story? And uh, we based a lot of it on her own true experience. Um, it's uh, opera is mythological though. We had to invent some things. We couldn't, you know, quote every single thing that she thought or heard, but it, uh, it resonated as very, very truthful and, and honest. And it evoked, um, I think some quite beautiful music. Uh, we had wonderful Caitlin Lynch, a soprano premiere the piece. We knew we were writing it for her as well as the great uh, musicians of Music of Remembrance. And, uh, uh, and you will see an ex example of that um, in a moment. But uh, it, it really was a, a continuation of a journey of, if we don't remember, are we doomed to be haunted and repeat these, uh, these terrible events? And uh, Christina's journey was uh, deeply inspiring and unlike uh, journeys that we had explored before. And Jean you, can, uh, Jean, you can tell a little bit about how you conceived the opera. I'm sure, Jake. Um, what was inter interesting is in 1946, uh, after the war, Christina Zabulska wrote a memoir, which was initially titled, I Came Back. And then it was retitled, I Survived Auschwitz. And the, our first impulse was to, uh, and of course, uh, use that book as a, as a springboard to uh, tell her story, her remarkable story. But as I was doing more research, um, I, I stumbled into or I found a book called um, Holocaust in Memory, in which uh, Christina Zhivolska was one of the Holocaust survivors who, uh, who was uh, interviewed. And this idea of how things are remembered, what are what are what memories are suppressed, what memories are changed, what memories are are, are acknowledged, sort of came to the fore of uh, of an idea for telling uh, this piece, uh, for exploring this. And so, as Jake said, this night of the soul, um, I use this interview as a sort of a point of departure. And what would have happened if Barbara Engelskin, which in fact did happen. Uh, interviewed uh, Christina and then uh, gave her a tape recorder and a time, uh, so, so not anachronistic, a reel-to-reel uh, -reel tape recorder, and said, if there's anything you've left out that you uh, want to share, you can just record, you can record it. And one night, uh, in the middle of the night, she gets up and she uh, starts uh, uh, recalling certain things. And so then we, we physically watch her turn the tape machine on and turn the tape machine off as the memories become too uh, difficult to uh, uh, to express or to to handle. And then that is the question. It's a little bit like uh, uh, Ibsen's The Wild Duck in this way. Like you know what what part of uh, uh, of the fiction that you write of of your life do you need in order to survive your life, and how much of the reality of it? And so this is what Christina is sort of struggling with as, as, the, as the piece uh, progresses. And it also becomes a, uh, a amusing on, as Jake was indicating, the nature of survival. You know, we, it's very easy to, uh, to, for the people who survived it, with the, the amazing people who survived uh, the Holocaust, um, to make them into the champions of, of the time. But they're human beings. They're flawed. They're, uh, they're, they have all sorts of struggles. Sometimes the people, sometimes the people who survived were the toughest ones, uh, and uh, and not the ones when there was a piece of bread they ate it rather than not uh, not eating it. So and and Christina, as we discover in the piece, has to uh, come to terms with being a Jew, hiding her identity, and taking the possessions and sort of surviving of of these uh, uh, women and, and and children who come off the transports. So that's kind of the the frame of the piece. Um, so it becomes rather than setting it uh, in it, there is memory where the where what happened in the camp comes to life, but it's really about how you remember it and how do you handle the memories and how do you process them as you go on with what uh, in Christina's case turned out to be a long life. She lived uh, till around 1990, I believe, and uh, so she lived a full life. So that's sort of the framework of the piece. So all of this uh, evokes a great deal to me regarding my parents' story, more specifically, my mother's story. Because the memories of what happened to my mother 
who's a Holocaust survivor, apparently were so overwhelming that she never spoke about them. She shared almost nothing about this story with me or my sister. And why would she? This is the worst part of her life. She kept it away. She kept it away for decades until the night of February 15, 2001, my mother, who was then living in Skokie, a 69-year-old widow, living in the little house in Skokie that I grew, my, my sister grew up in. One night, that night, she packed two shopping bags full of clothes and essentials and ran for her life on the streets of Skokie and was picked up by the Skokie police and brought to a relative's house. And the next night, she did it again until we finally realized we had to keep her in a safe place. But I did not connect what she was doing with her unspoken Holocaust childhood. It took a year until we got a diagnosis that she was reliving the past, that she had late onset post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. And finally, for the first time in my life, my experience, the dam had burst. I had to find out what happened to her. And I'll just say in a few sentences, my mother was born in uh, Dubna, Poland in 1931. 1939, the Russians invaded, took over the house. Two years later, the Nazis arrived and executions began. And by the fall of 1942, virtually the entire Jewish population of Dubna had been executed, 12,000 Jews. Less than 100 are believed to have survived and my mother is one of them. All of this came back at her, at my mother. And I didn't figure out the significance of the date that she ran out of her house until my wife, Pam Becker, pointed out that that was the exact 10th anniversary of the death of my father, the one person in whom my mother had placed her trust. And this tells us something about the overwhelming power of memory. I think my mother spent her, her adulthood trying to keep that memory at bay, and finally it didn't anymore. And this, I think, probably this is what we're coming to terms with when we see another sunrise. So, Rahim, perhaps now we should go to this excerpt of uh, what happened in Auschwitz. Can I introduce the excerpt just a second? Um, thank you, Howard. So this is, uh, uh, Christina has turned, turned the tape recorder on and she's going to tell uh, the story of how she became um, the camp poet. She got this, this job in the Effectenkammer and a transport from Holland arrives and she has to, for the first time, decide, is she going to survive this or is she gonna go back to the fields and die with her poems? And she's faced with a moment of truth about survival.
that's uh, Caitlin Lynch, the soprano that we wrote it for, who will also be singing it coming up in May in um, uh, at Chicago Opera Theater. Um, I forget sometimes how harrowing that moment is uh, between times, the decision of whether you're going to survive or not in a, in a terrible place like that. And the, the question Jean and I wanted to explore too was none of us know, none of us can say what we would do when the gun is pointed at our head about do this or you die. And, um, and that, that kind of story, uh, it has to be shared. It has to be remembered and told. Um, and that was part of uh, what we needed to explore in Another Sunrise. Awesome. Minna, do you want to set up the next excerpt? Um, sure. We're going to now play Socialized Dying. And um, it, it's a very, very moving, uh, tender part of uh, Christina confronting just that moment. Um, Jean, do you want to share any words about? Uh, it's just, it's um, what happened. It's a very, moment. It's, pardon? It's, a very, it's a very human touching moment that there's room for kindness in the midst of all this. Uh, in the midst of, she had a friend who was dying and, uh, uh, and she found a moment to sneak her some water. And uh, it's just this, uh, this intimacy between these two people who sort of found themselves in this horrible circumstance. And also it's, it's, it's in light of Christina Zhivulska uh, dealing with uh, what you just experienced, but also finding some sort of intimacy and, and connection uh, 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 in the camp through this person who, as you'll hear, uh, lies, uh, winds up dying uh, um, in front of her. So. Raheem, could we have that example, please? And it'll be amazing to hear Caitlin Lynch sing that, sing that role again um, with Music of Remembrance at Chicago Opera Theater. Um, a great artist, great artist, yeah. Well, this is music, as you experience, a heart-stopping beauty. But it also does more. It, it helps us to appreciate all Holocaust survivors and all their complexity. And I, I have to say, 
the touching moment, there are no words, that has stayed with me forever. And it's an instant tear on my face. And it's happened when I performed it. It happens when I listen to it. One of the most cherished things, Jake, that you ever gave me was a manuscript page that yes. has those words. And it's actually behind me here. Well, and it, it's a big part of all the stories that we have uh, worked on together you know, what are the words? How do you find the words to describe what happened to you in your life, especially as something as harrowing as what Christina went through? I think, uh, what, we're, I think what we've always trying to do is uh, we're telling the story, but really more than anything, it's sort of emotional archeology. span We're trying to, uh, rather than just explain what happened, we're trying to explain what it felt like. And the, the beauty of music, of course, the strength of music is it's the greatest conduit to, uh, to accomplish that. And so in, in this case, I literally say there are no words and let Jake's music and that extraordinary voice of Caitlin's uh, 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 let us uh, feel uh, what, uh, uh, what this felt like to the extent that we can, uh, rather than trying to explain this happened, that happened. It's like, this is what it felt like. And the, and the best way I know uh, is to have, a, a, you know, a gifted voice like Jake's and uh, Caitlin's come together to uh, make uh, make us feel, allow us to feel a little shadow of what uh, was experienced. But the first piece we did for Music of Remembrance was for a look or a touch, right, Minna? Yes, 2007. Boy, was that a journey. It was the first time ever that Music of Remembrance uh, did a theatrical work. We were a chamber music organization, and actually, you know, when we were, when we wanted to commission a work to explore the persecution of gays and the Holocaust, I originally approached Jake about doing a song cycle, and it was Jake and Jean that came to the decision that we needed to have a, a, a drama, a musical drama, to tell a story, and of course, they are storytellers, uh, superb, the words and music. And um, For Look or a Touch uh, is, is based on the true story of um, Gadbeck and Mathilde Levine, uh, two idealistic young lovers in 1930s Berlin whose lives and love were torn apart under Nazi rule. And in 2007, it was the first work to explore the persecution of gays through music. And it remains to be the only major musical work um, to address this subject. And this subject, um, sadly, is still, you know, little known and too rarely discussed. So we're going to change that. <laughs> we're going to discuss it some more today and show you, uh, share some excerpts. Right. Um, I wanted to say when, when Minna approached me about uh, the persecution of gays during the Holocaust, it was an aspect that I've never heard of, and I'm gay. I didn't know this part of, uh, of, of the history of the Holocaust. And so when she wanted a song cycle, I started looking for texts and there was nothing. Uh, I couldn't find texts from survivors or about the experience. And I realized it was illegal to be gay in, in Germany and in many places up and in Germany up through the end of the, the 70s, you know, the 60s, early six, uh, late 60s, early 60s. 70s, finally. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, but it was still. Uh, a lot of these people, like, you know, Howard, you said your mother didn't want to talk about it, didn't want to remember. And a lot of people didn't feel anyone wanted to hear their story, you know. And this movie came out called Paragraph 175, remarkable documentary uh, that tells the stories uh, that, that these are uh, survivors in their 80s now. The, the, the movie's already 15, 20 years old. These are these 20 plus years old. Um, these are survivors now in their 80s who, uh, were arrested and imprisoned because they were gay, who are now able to tell their stories. And uh, one of them was Gad Beck. And uh, we, uh, I watched that documentary and, and I said to Jean, Jean, we have to find some way to weave these stories, even though they're from different people. How can we weave this into an evening? Um, and so Jean came on board and he found a way. We had an actor who speaks and we have a baritone who sings, who is the 19 year old Manfred Levine and who returns on a dark night of soul for Gad Beck as a ghost. Because of, go of course, the ghost only wants to be remembered and, re and loved and cherished, not forgotten. And Gad, who is now in his 80s, has spent his life pushing away those memories just in order to get by. And finally, they, they're able to share, share stories, stories that Gad has been a 
afraid to hear about what happened to Manfred, about what happened to him in the camp, how he was killed. Um, and yet the love that they share does survive. And so it's this, this dialogue between the two of them that became very, very moving and unlike any other piece I'd ever explored or worked on. And uh, a real challenge because uh, Manfred sings, Gad only speaks until a redemptive moment when he can embrace his past and he can finally find music in his life at the end again. Um, but it was, it was a big challenge, a very, very exciting project and it's been done all over the world now. One, one, of, one of the things about this piece is that Manfred Levin's uh, 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 diary, his journal, is actually at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. And I got a, uh, a digital copy of it. And, uh, and luckily I, I speak German, so I was able to translate, translate some of it, which weaves its way into uh, part of the uh, libretto. Uh, but as Jake said, it is, it's, again, it's a story of, of memory uh, of, of how it's processed rather than going back and just watching what they experienced at the time. It's not, we are confronting what they experienced at the time and also the fun. There's love uh, and, and the joy of being together when they're young lovers, that's expressed with this un, you know, unbridled love. And then of course, what happens. So it, it sort of, it all, it all uh, weaves together, but there are, there was an addition, and there were also a lot of, as Jake said, the paragraph 175 was key, that 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 film. I mean, one of the guys who's uh, the elder uh, older gentleman, when he's telling his story, he explains that, you know, he was, of course, arrested and he spent times in the camp. And then after the war, he was rearrested uh, for being gay and, and went back, to, went to prison for being gay. So this is what they were confronting. So no wonder they wouldn't tell their stories. I mean, it was a, a, a you know, a double, double whammy kind of. They just, there was no way for them to, uh, to express it. But we found a way of uh, uh, weaving this together and expressing both the love that these guys had for each other and the challenge of living through that moment. And also, as as Jake was just suggesting, uh, how Gad is processing the memory of this, and it's very—I think it's very, very touching at the end when he, uh, when the ghost wants to. The ghost, of course, is part of his his uh, sort of struggling in his mind, but so wants to be remembered, and he wants to forget, as Jake just said. And finally, he embraces it, and he says, "I remember. I remember everything." Yeah. And uh, and uh, it's very uh, touching. Uh, uh, and again, made really made possible by the extraordinary film, uh, Paragraph 175, that- uh, We, we, uh, uh, we wanted, well, our first excerpt is that joyful moment, going yeah. back to their golden years in Berlin. And uh, it's fun, it's sexy, and it's full of life because it's very important to know what was lost um, when we explore these pieces. Right. Um, and so this is uh, from a filmed uh, performance that featured baritone uh, Jarrett Ott, and actor Kirk Branham as Gad Beck. Um, and uh, we're gonna see a little bit of Golden Years. Is that right, Minna? Yes. Or a 
touch, and I'll know you're the one. A grin or a smile, <laughs> and for a while tonight, or a lifetime, let's not miss out on a chance for love right now. <laughs> Very important to remember those joyful moments and then to see what was lost. Um, and the next clip is a little bit later um, when <clears throat> this is a number that was actually added after, um, after the premiere um, in 2007. In 2011, it was expanded to include a, the gay men's chorus in Seattle and we needed a number for the chorus. So we wrote a piece called 100,000 Stars and that became to, to acknowledge that uh, the 100,000 plus uh, gay and lesbian people that were imprisoned or killed um, during the Holocaust. And uh, um, then it was incorporated into the full piece. And so um, this, uh, this is an excerpt from 100,000 Stars that goes directly into a monologue uh, where Gad is able, finally able to express what happened to him the night he tried to save Manfred and the anger and rage he has been keeping bottled up all these years. What is that I hear? The train is passing by. Another star has vanished, stolen from the sky. Hush, my love, hush, my love, hush, my love. Must not be afraid now. This will not be the end. A hundred million stars will be born to fill the sky again. You never are alone. I swear I'm by your side. There's very little light. Oh, Wiedersehen, adieu. I went to your house to spend the night. Your brother told me that you and most of your family had been arrested that day. I went to your boss. I was desperate. He, he asked me 
Do you have courage? Yes! Yes! I have courage! My son is your size. He has a Hitler Youth uniform. Put it on. Get Manfred out! My, my heart was pounding as I went in and saluted. Heil Hitler! I must speak with the Obersturmbannführer. He came at once. Man Manfred Levin was brought here yesterday. He worked for us and is a saboteur. He has keys to several of the apartments we are renovating. My father sent me to get him so we can go back to work. Within moments, you and I were free. Walking down the street, <laughs> I said, go, go, go to Uncle Bobby's. I'll call and meet you there. And you looked at me. No, no I can't, I can't go, go with, with you, Gad. Gad. If, if I, I leave my family, family now, I'll, I'll never be, be free, free again. again. I, I have, have to, to go, go with, with them. them. I, I am the strong, strong one. one. Wow, I'm so I'm so grateful we get to hear that again in Chicago coming up soon um, with Ryan McKinney and Kurt Branham and wonderful music of remembrance. It's been such a great journey with you, Minna, over these years, um, and that journey is going to continue now with Howard. <laughs> into yes. the future. I'm one very lucky person that I was able to ask Jake and Jean to consider writing another opera for us and to mark our 25th anniversary. And uh, as I said, it's a privilege of a lifetime to work with this incredible team. And of course, the part of the hardest thing in doing a work is finding the story. And uh, Jake, uh, can you tell us how you discovered the story? And then Howard, <laughs> it's your story, so. <laughs> uh, Howard, I just remember we connected through Dead Man Walking, um, my opera Dead Man Walking, when it was done in Lyric Opera Chicago and, in 2019. And we stayed in touch. And I was going to be in Chicago. And we decided to have dinner. And I told you about our connection with Music of Remembrance and looking for stories. And then what happened? So I, we asked each other what we were working on. And so you said you got a commission for Music of Remembrance that does the kind of work that it does. And I thought, well, maybe I made a, an unsolicited suggestion, uh, which is what journalists do. And I said, um, maybe you could do it about looted art. I don't think there's been a piece on uh, an opera on looted art. And then I remember, then that moment I remember a story I did 20 years earlier. And this is basically the story, which I'll just say in a nutshell. Uh, the Jewish Museum in Prague had been able to prove that about 30 artworks had been looted from a man murdered during the Holocaust named Emil Freund, but they could not find an heir. And the Czech government had passed laws that it was the mandate of the Jewish Museum to find the heirs and to return the art to the heirs. So the Jewish Museum contacted the Art Loss Register. The Art Loss Register con uh, contacted me because I've been working on a lot of restitution stories at the time. And they said, there's this looted connection. We know who it belonged to. We can not find the heir. Do you think you can? So I thought, I will try. Through looking up records and whatnot, I was able to find who I believe, what, identify who I believe was the heir. And I went to his house and it was incredible. It was this man who was a Vietnam veteran, had PTSD diagnosed, hepatitis C, was living in disability checks, and did not know he had any Jewish heritage. And I told him, if you are who I think you are, well, it was a Gerald McDonald. Three weeks 
After my story appeared on the front page of the Chicago Tribune, the Czech government declared half of that collection to be natural, national cultural treasures that cannot be removed from the country or sold on the international market or repatriated. Gerald McDonald was furious about this, understandably, he had been given and taken away. He was determined to go to Prague to see the art and see if he could get it back. And I'm not, not gonna say what happened because let the opera tell that story, but it was a surprising outcome and it changed uh, McDonald's life, it changed my life, and at least the truth was told. And now it's changed our lives. I just, I remember you telling me this story about looted art, about Gerald McDonald, about the trip to Prague, to, to learn about a, an ancestor, a relative that he, he never knew, he never knew he had, he did an identity that he never had, that his family had kept hidden from him. Again, they didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to share what had happened. And it opened up uh, a community to him, an identity that he could embrace. And also that he had a relative that believed in beauty and beauty and art that would transcend time, that would transcend uh, any kind of barrier language otherwise. And I found the story, uh, Howard, so moving. I got the, the shiver that I need, the shiver that I had when Minna first approached us about uh, you know, gays in the Holocaust about Christina Zhivolska's story. Here was that same shiver, and um, and Howard uh, agreed to join us on the journey, and uh, uh, and Jean was moved by it as well as was Minna. Yeah, and we we've, we've explored, we've learned so much. Jean, go ahead. No, it was it was a, it's an incredible story, and I felt as Jake did that it was a, just a great uh, point of departure for a story. One of the things that you, you mentioned to us, Howard, was that. And it comes clear in the in the story that you told and we tried to tell is that he went there for the art for the to get the art, but it, when he was there, it became really a story of identity and and feeling connection. And it's also in light of you know it's a question of time of life for all of us. But for his when you are facing, uh, he knew he wasn't going to live. For, uh, he had hepatitis C. He was you know this was he was towards the end. He didn't know exactly how long, but he didn't. And so at that point in your life, what matters? Is it, you know, it's, it's not your bank account or your uh, thing. It's how you connect. You know, Jake and I, we've written uh, in a line at a different show. It's not about escape. It's about connection. You know, that's what art is really about. You think it's about, you know, finding a way to, to escape the world. No, it's a way of, of connecting to the world and connecting to who you are, where you come from, and, and also what your community now in your life, because it's all about, I mean, this is something that also, you know, it's also springboards out of COVID a little bit in terms of, you know, a lack of, of connection. And this guy uh, was kind of like as if he were living in COVID prior to COVID because he was separated from the world because of his uh, condition, PTSD and, uh, and, uh, and the hepatitis, and also just his, his life story. And so to, to find a person who's, uh, who, who goes there who, and what really matters to him is to, to uh, uncover and to be connected to where he came from and that community. Uh, I found. I love. I love too that part of the. I love yeah. part of the story. Howard describe Mac as a person. Yeah. Because. So Mac is incredible. Mac was a wonder. Uh, when I first knocked on the door, not knowing if I had the right guy or not, um, the when I first knocked on the door, he didn't hear me because his heavy metal music was blasting for twenty minutes, and I'm standing outside of his door, like a fool, waiting to get in. Finally, he answers the door. And there's this giant there. I mean, to me, most people look like the giant, but he really was one. And he's wearing jeans and a, and a t-shirt and he has tattoos up and down his arm. And this is not the kind of guy I usually hang out with. And, uh, hmm. But he is so smart. He is so savvy. He's been through it all. He's seen it all. And I think that's why Mac had the courage and wherewithal, even though he was so sick to go and do this trip. I just want to say one more detail here. When he packed his bag, one, one suitcase was packed with clothes. The other suitcase was packed with medicine. That tells you the state that he was in and how important this journey was to him. Wow. And uh, another part, even though this is giving away a little bit of the story, that's okay, because emotionally the story is so complex. Uh, what he brought back with him, I think, is also incredibly moving, if you can tell that part of it, Howard. So at the very end, the Czech government is not going to be releasing these paintings to him, you know, but he he found uh, where Emil Freund died. We went to Lodz to, to, to find that. And the last evening we were there, we were out in the plaza and they were selling junk out in the plaza. 
And he bought this painting for 75 bucks and he puts it in his suitcase. And that the connection that he would not get was worth millions. What he got was a $75 painting and a new sense of who he is. Yeah. Wow. That's it. Wow. Yeah. I, I, I just I'm I'm here. Here already. It's a, uh, I, I just saw um, Tom Stoppard's play Leopoldstadt um, in uh, New York. And uh, in reading about Stoppard's journey to writing that play, he talks about going to the synagogue in Prague where you guys went. And yeah. there's a, a wall where the, a list of people who perished uh, is, uh, is, is there. And uh, uh, Mac, Gerald Mac McDonald, you know, he saw that he saw his, the name of Emil Freund on the wall. And Stoppard in the same synagogue saw the names of his family as he was uncovering uh, things. So it's uh, it just, it was something that sort of struck me as we were doing it. So it's, it, Howard's story is a, a, that he uncovered is an amazing story. And uh, we're uh, really happy to, uh, to, to be working on it and to bring it to yeah. life. And, yeah. uh, and that'll, be next year. that'll be next year. Next this year. year, you're touring Another Sunrise and Pearl Liquor Touch. And next year we have uh, before it all goes dark to look forward yeah, to. So uh, actually, you can put the dates down. Uh, coming Memorial Day weekend, Saturday evening and Sunday matinee, you'll be able to see our extraordinary artists and these incredible singers and actor uh, in another uh, sunrise and for a look or a touch and come back the following year. Same Memorial Day weekend, Saturday and Sunday, you will be able to experience the world premiere of Before It All Goes Dark. And actually, if you come to our production um, this May, uh, Howard and Jake will have a pre-concert talk about Before It All Goes Dark, and, um, and that'll be exciting in itself to have that Q&A. Because all I can say, as soon as Jake heard that story, he got in touch with me immediately, and he just said, this is it. This is incredible. And uh, brought Howard into our circle, too, which I'm so happy about, you know? It's not often that I become friends with a former critic from a major paper. <laughs> yeah, I think the key word there is former. <laughs> yes, that's right, retired. <laughs> well, this has been such a, an exciting time and um, we're so grateful to Raheem and the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center for hosting us today and for letting us give you a preview of what's to come uh, and I'll tell you how excited we are to be coming to the Chicago area and to bringing these incredible works of Jake and Jean and to be introducing uh, this coming May Howard's work and to return to Chicago. We're not a one night stand. <laughs> so uh, those of you in the audience, I hope to get to meet you personally in our audience uh, this coming May. I want to thank you so much. And I believe now uh, we could be ready to take some questions. And I will let uh, Raheem uh, handle that. All right, sorry everyone, I'm back. Thank you. All right, so I'll start with our first question. We have Sarah Neely. Uh, hello, dear friends, is Sarah Neely in Hawaii? Right. <laughs> Do you know if the Chicago production will be available via digital broadcast? Minna, that's for you. Sure. Um, I assume you're referring to the production we're doing this May. Mm -hmm. um, well, we will be recording it, and we expect to make it available um, for streaming perhaps um, maybe two months after the performance. So we do intend to record it and, uh, and, and make it available. Yes. I can't give you an exact date, but I would say perhaps by August 1, we'll make it available for a limited viewing time, but it won't be um, an online stream of the actual performance. It will be re-recorded re and then streamed at a later date. All right, we do have um, a few minutes left and I wanna use this time to give you all the floor. If you would like to talk about maybe perhaps future projects, how people in our audience can uh, reach you and stay connected to your work even if they're not in Chicago, or um, how can they follow your work? And yeah, what's next? <laughs> well, for Music of Remembrance, we are based in Seattle. And uh, our next concert is this uh, production, the Heggy Shear Double Bill with Another Sunrise for Look or a Touch. You'll be able to see it on May 21. If you're in the Bay Area, you'll be able to experience it on May 24. 
And then, of course, in the Chicago area, as I mentioned, Memorial Day weekend. Um, we have a full season of concerts in uh, fall 23 and, 20, and going through the seasons of 24. Uh, we have programs occasionally online. Uh, we do stream uh, past productions periodically through the year. In the coming um, in 23, we have a concert in the fall, which actually will have a focus on the Native American experience as well as Holocaust music. Uh, January 27th, we have our Freedom Community International Holocaust Remembrance Day concert. In March, uh, we are uh, doing a program that will feature a new work by the Iranian American composer Saba Amenikia, uh, titled Phoenix, which is about the women's struggle in Iran. And then in May, uh, our world premiere of Before It All Goes Dark. Of course, you can reach us uh, through our website, musicofremembrance.org, and you can contact us by email at info at musicofremembrance.org. And uh, um, I'm, I'm easy to find. jakehege.com is the, the website. And uh, I've got a couple of good things coming up. Uh, the Metropolitan Opera season is going to open with my first opera, Dead Man Walking, that I wrote with librettist Terence McNally 22 years ago. Um, and that, so that opens in September. I have a new work for Joshua Bell that he's doing with the New York Philharmonic just a few days after that. And then uh, my 10th opera, and I don't remember which opera this is for us, Gene, maybe eight or nine, um, our new opera opens uh, the Houston Grand Opera season in October, and it's called Intelligence. Um, and it's about women spies in the South during the Civil War. So those are just a few things coming, coming up. Just a few, the little <laughs> things. Right. And, and, and I, as, as Jake just mentioned, we have uh, Intelligence opening at Houston. And um, uh, soon thereafter, I have an opera based on the diving bell and the butterfly that I've written with Joby Talbot which will open in uh, at the Dallas Opera. Uh, it opens on November 3rd of uh, this coming uh, season. And then uh, um, I'm working on some other thing. I'm working on a piece with Mason Bates at the moment. And, uh, and of course, Jake and I will be uh, weaving things together um, forever. So that's <laughs> what we look forward to, or forever, as long as, as, long as the journey lasts. Yeah. So uh, that's, uh, that's, what I've, that's some of the things I've been working on. And well, Howard? I find, it, I find it strange to say the words I'm about to say, but. Um, I've written a ballet, yes? I've, uh, <laughs> I've written a story and scenario for a ballet uh, that will have its uh, world premiere next year in Canada, danced by the dancers of the Royal Winnipeg Ballet. Mm -hmm. And it tells the story of one family before, during, and after Japanese Canadian internment during World War II. Mm -hmm. And before coming to the story, I did not realize that the Canadians did the same things that the Americans did, imprisoned its own citizens of Japanese descent. Uh, and in some ways, their story was even more harsh uh, than, than what happened here. And that's based on the real, the true story of the family of uh, Christine Mori and Alexis Spieldenner, who created the Bravo Niagara Arts Festival. And I'll just say one more sentence, which is, it's an amazing experience to write a story that will be told with no words. Literally, mm -hmm. there are no words here because it's ballet, uh, but it's been thrilling to work on. And you can find me at howardwright.com. And Howard, you also have a PBS production of Prisoner of Her Past, don't you? Prisoner of Her Past, The Story of My Mother, um, has aired across the country and will have its 13th annual broadcast uh, on WTTW Channel 11 in Chicago on April 16th at 2 p.m. in honor of upcoming Holocaust Remembrance Day. Thank you for mentioning that. Thank you. And a, bit, a big thank you to all of you <laughs> that participated. We're so grateful. Thank you so much for having us today. And we'll see you at Chicago Opera Theater in May. Yes, thank you all so very much. Until May, thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you all. Have a great day.